environment and infrastructure. As implied by its alternate name of Kampuchea Lik Tuk, or Flooded Cambodia, Kampuchea Krom sees an abundance of water, with events like high flooding, high rainfall, and seawater incursions varying with the seasons. The abundance of water brought by these events, together with the natural flat plain that characterizes its region, makes Kampuchea Krom a productive agricultural area with rich, fertile soils. However, its swampy and amphibious nature, accompanied by seasonal dry spells, have resulted in researchers' characterization of the region as resistant to human settlement, with significant infrastructural development required to make permanent settlement possible. Anthropologist Philip Taylor's ethnographic text on Khmer communities within Kampuchea Krom identifies a number of strategies employed by the Khmer to utilize local precipitation for the purposes of agriculture and consumption, even during the dry season. These strategies differ across its geomorphically distinct subregions. One key strategy is that of harvesting fresh rainwater stored within the snow, a strategy that is particularly prominent within the northern coastal complex. The northern coastal complex is a flange of flat, salt-impregnated land lying between the mouths of the Mekong and Basak rivers and bounded by the ocean to the east an area often perceived as the quintessential Khmer region of Vietnam by researchers and tourists alike. The region sees annual wet and dry seasons. Its rainy season lasts from May to December and covers the majority of the region with water. During the dry season, however, soil surfaces crack and drinking water becomes extremely scarce. Taylor identifies the snow, or elevated ridges of coarse sandy soil, between 1 to 5 meters high, as crucial to the sustenance of life within the northern coastal complex, constituting both cosmological and strategic significance for the Khmers in the region. According to Taylor's interlocutor, a poly teacher in the region, the snow were the first land to emerge, and comprised the ancient lands of Subanifum, through which the Buddha traversed during his travels across the world. According to the abbot of Wat Nong Sra, Buddhist Khmer thought further explains the stratification of the world and its elements, where humans live upon the land, water supports the land, and water rests on air, otherwise expressed in Khmer as Kyo Tro Tuk, air supports water. Tuk Tro Day, water supports land. Day Tro Mun Nu, land supports people. Alongside this cosmological explanation of the elements, Taylor cites people at the Travin Museum of Khmer Culture and other locals to suggest that it is the height of the snow and the numerousness of the snow in the region that has made the northern coastal dune complex habitable and one of the oldest inhabited places in Kampuchea Krom. Further, though groundwater in the region is salinated throughout the year, the absorption and retention of fresh rainwater by the sand dunes during the rainy months creates natural freshwater reservoirs for residents. The less dense freshwater remains above the denser saline groundwater without mingling, both of which lie at a shallow depth beneath apparently dry land and accessible with some digging. Irrigation Numerous irrigation projects have been undertaken in Kampuchea Krom, including by the French during the colonial period of the mid-20th century, and by the Vietnamese, following their significant expansion into the region in the 19th century and the post-war period of the late 20th century. Environmental historian David Biggs argues that these irrigation projects have often reflected states' desires to incorporate the region into their nation-building projects. The construction of such irrigation infrastructure has also been the source of a number of Khmer-led rebellions within the region, see Vinte Canal. Improvements to Crop Yield Researchers assessing changes in agricultural production within the region often assess that the infrastructural development of such irrigation projects have been a success, citing statistics like the doubling of rice production in the delta between 1980 and 1995, following the digging of canals and raising of dikes. 
Kono Yasuyuki argues that the moderation of the hydrological environment by infrastructure improvement is essential for agricultural intensification and diversification in the deltas, and for the production of a substantial surplus of rice and its export.